the Masonic origins of Mormonism or the Church of Jesus Christ and the Latter-day Saints. This is a Christian denomination or, depending who you ask, its own religion, originated by the charlatan and fraud and liar Joseph Smith, who combined many elements of este, to make este, Mormonism mix of primitive Christianity, Methodism, Freemasonry, folk magic, the King James Bible Puritans, and 19th century theories about Native American origins. As his involvement with magic makes clear, Joseph was interested in anything that entailed secret knowledge. Therefore, it was only natural that he embraced Freemasonry. While the occult revealed secrets how to harness supernatural powers, Freemasonry imparted hidden knowledge of King Solomon's temple to initiate the members. This secret knowledge proved very useful for Joseph when he was dev devising the Mormon priesthoods and endowment ceremonies, like folk magic, Freemasonry played an important role in forging the origins of Mormonism. Instrumental in shaping early Mormonism, necessary to consult 19th century Masonic sources, the most important one are the Freemason Monitor by Thomas Webbs in 1808, the Tunka's Masonic Ritual and Monitor, 3rd edition, 1866, Albert McKay's Symbolism of Freemasonry, 1869, and the writings of William Morge, who exposed was uh, was published in the form of two books, The Illustration of Freemasonry of 1827 and The Mysteries of Freemasonry of in 1829. Many elements of the Mormonism, Deism, Theology, and Theology has its roots in a variety of sources. But, for example, because we're focusing on the Freemason influence of it, one of the biggest influence of the of Mormonism from the Freemasonry was the second vision. It's the element of Mormon mythology that is rooted in the occult and Freemasonry. Despite his many influence of the Mormon the mythology, Joseph's affinity for Freemasonry is tied to the fact that he was interested in anything. It was tied to the fact that he was interested in anything that contained secret knowledge, but unlike the occult, we revealed to secret how to harness supernatural powers and uh, disclose the uh, knowledge pertaining to King Solomon's. It, uh, because Freemasonry contributes so much to Mormonism, it is worth the time to explain what it is. Freemasonry consists of rituals that are meant to symbolize Solomon's temple and makes it participate in its construction. Freemasonry can be traced back to the Masonic guilds of medieval Europe, although there is no actual evidence to back it up. It, uh, in an attempt to increase membership, Many guilds recruit non maces as honorary members. The accommodate these honorary members' symbolic rights were borrowed for the nice order of Europe. Media and lodges are supposed to symbolize Solomon's temple. Members participate in highly ritualistic initiation ceremonies in which they swore themselves to secrecy upon pain of death. Because remember, back in the day, uh, religious heresy was a thing. And for the purpose of identifying themselves as not being imposters, members of a Masonic Lodge learn a secret handshake, sign, and password during the initiation ceremony. After being fully acquainted in such rites, new members were adorned with a white lambskin apron. More about, uh, more about the apron, secret rites, and penalty oaths will, uh, uh, will be found in other areas. Like, for example, documentaries that I highly recommend called 33 and Beyond, uh, the Inside of Freemasons, The Secret of the Masons, Terra Masonica, and another one that I can't remember. Ah, the, the Scottish Rite. The Masonic Lodges in England became widespread, and now they were organized under the Central Grand Lodge in 1717. The term Freemasonry was adopted because prospective Masons were required to be freeborn and acting on their own free will. Freemasonry quickly extended its reach across the Atlantic, with the first American Grand Lodge being opened in Boston in, on July 30, 1743. Uh, Freemasonry was influential among all American social classes. The Smiths were not exempt, for Jerome Smith joined the Mount Moria Lodge in Pomoria, New York, who he was required to pay quarterly dues of $0.50 in 1828. Masonic influence can be found all of the Latter-day Saints standard works, including the Book of Mormon. 
Just the familiarity with the Freemasonry can be contributed to the fact that his brother Hiram was practicing Mason before the Book of Mormon was published. There was also a vast amount of literature in the form of books, pamphlets, monitors, and newspaper articles. Some of the most prominent include Thomas Webb's The Freemason Murder in 1808 and William Mogus Exposed, which was published in the form of two books, The Illustration of Freemasonry in 1827 and The Mysteries of Freemasonry in 1829. It's not surprising that Smith familiarized with some with Masonic folklore, aside from being printed in several publications. Some legends were probably orally recited. The legend of Enoch is one Masonic story that Joseph was more certainly aware of. This assertion is supported by the fact that the Book of Moses, an inspired translation of Genesis, dedicated 110 verses to Enoch when the Bible devoted only five. It's evident that these 110 verses were influenced by Freemasonry because Smith incorporated a lot of Masonic language into the text. The Book of Moses stated, and I quote, For Lamech heavy entered into covenant with Satan, after the manner of Cain, where he became Master Meham, Master of the Great Secret, which was a minister unto Cain by Satan. Where Lamech, being angry, slew him, not for the sake of getting gain, but he slew him for the oath's sake. For, uh, for from the days of Cain, there was a secret combination. Their words were in the dark. They knew every man his brother. The language used in Moses chapter 5 verse 49 to 51 is clearly 19th century in origin. Within the free lord's degrees of masonry, the precise officer is called Master Mason. This is a term that closely resembles Master Mayhem in the book of Moses. Just like members of Cain's secret combination who knew very man his brother, Freemasons also call each other brother. In a 19th century pamphlet titled Secret Societies, a discussion of their character and claims, it states in the charge of delivered to Master Mason and his initiation, he is enjoined to exercise benevolence toward every true and worthy brother of the order. Masonic lodges often refer to a secret society or secret combination, were highly criticized for their secrecy and oaths. And because many of the conspiracy free with 99% of the time was anti-Semitic in nature because the Freemasons were the first or one of the very early secret society they allowed the Jews to join. So that's why many conspiracy theory we see today has this roots in anti-Semitism. Stories spread that Mason upheld these oaths even in case of murder, much like Cain's secret combination was accused of doing. The same pamphlet explains a mason may be engaged in a wicked rebellion and may stay his soul and hands with innocent blood, and still he must be recognized as a brother. While he does briefly state the objectable features, what are generally called secret society, it is mainly to their secrecy, oath, and promises. With Masonic influence being very apparent in the Book of Moses, it's, understand, it's understandable that Smith wanted to dedicate 110 verses to Enoch. As stated earlier, Enoch was an important figure in Masonic folklore. The story of which he engraved the name God upon a gold plate before burying in Mount Moria is the most important legend. Albert G. McCain retells it as follows. Enoch, under the inspiration of the Most High, and in obedience to the instruction which he had received in a vision, built a temple underground on Mount Moria and dedicated to God. His son, Methuselah, constructed and built the building. This temple consists of nine vaults situated particularly beneath each other and communicated by apparatus left in each vault. Enoch then caused a triangular plate of gold to be made, each side of which was a cubit long. He enriched it with the most precious stone and encrusted the plate upon a stone of a jade of the same form. On the plate he engraved the true name of God, or the Tetagramantan, and placed it on a cubical stone, nor therefore is the stone of foundation that deposited the hole within the lowest arch, when this subterranean building was completed, made of door stone and attached to a ring of iron, by which it might be occasionally raised, he placed it upon the opening of the uppermost arch, and so covered it in that the, the apparatus could not be discovered. Enoch himself was not permitted to enter but once a year, after the days of Enoch, Methuselah, and Lamech, and the destruction of the world by the deluge, all knowledge of the world or subterranean temple, and of the stone of foundation, with the sacred and infallible name its scribe upon it was lost for ages to the world. End quote. Smith evidently used this legend as a following comparison uh, the God place and the legend Ego had in common. He started the comparison. The legend of Enoch 
uh, Ina engraved an infallible name of God upon a gold plate and buried in a secret vault in Mount Moria. In the Book of Mormon, Moria, after making a final bridge, buries the gold plate in the hill of Cumorah. In the legend of Enoch, Enoch buries the gold plate in Mount Moria before the human race is destroyed by a great flood. The Book of Mormon, Moroni, the very last Nephi, buries the gold plate in the hill of Cumorah after the Nephi civilization is completely destroyed by war. The legend of Enoch, uh, Enoch was instructed by the Lord to visit the secret location of the gold every year. While the Book of Mormon, Joseph Smith was instructed by an angel to visit a hiding place of the gold place every year. Drawing upon more than just the legend of Enoch, Joseph tried to emulate Kiram Abif when telling the story of how did he retrieved the gold place from the hill Kumar. Himar Abif, the grand architect of Solomon's temple, was attacked by three ruffians wanting to know the secret of a master mason, also known as the master's word. Refusing to divulge the master's word, Abif was killed when he was accosted by the third ruffian. According to Morgan, Hiraf, having finished his devotions and labor, attempted, as was his casual, uh, usual custom, to retire at the south gate, where he was met by Jubila, who demanded of him the master mason's word. Some say the secret of a master mason, and that he is refusing to give it. Jubila gave him a violent bow with a 24-inch gouge across the throat, in which Hiram fled to the west gate, where he was uh, caused to the same matter by Jubilo, but with more violence. Hira told him that he could not give the word then, because Solomon, king of Israel, Hiram, king of Tyre, and himself had entered into the Solomon League that the world never should be given, and of Hiram's refusal to give it, Jubilo gave him a, several, a severe blow with a square across the left breast, and of which he fled to the east gate, where he was uh, accosted uh, by Jub Jibolum in the same manner, but with still more violence, and was determined to have a word or take his life. Hiram persisted in his refusal, and he gave Miran a violent blow with a gravel on the forehead, which fallen him to the floor and killed him. Modeling himself at the Hiram Abif, Smith claimed that he was assaulted three times by three different men while carrying the gold plate away with away from the hill Kumura. But unlike Abif, Joseph escaped the third attack with his life intact. Lucy Smith gives the following account of what her son told her. Joseph, on coming to them, the gold plate took them from their secret place and wrapped them in his leading flock, placed them under his arm and started for home. Traveling some distance after he left the road, he came to a large windfall. As he was jumping over a log, a man sprang up from behind them and gave him a heavy blow with a gun. Joseph turned around and knocked him down, then ran at the top of his speed. About a half a mile further, he was attacked again in the same manner as before. He knocked his man down in like a manner as a former and ran on again. And, pre and before he reached home, he was assaulted a third time. He struck the last one, he dis uh, dislocated his thumb, which, however, he did not notice until he came within the sight of the house. The Masonic legend of parading tales and fictional stories cited in this chapter effectively illustrate how Joseph utilized contemporary literature. However, the superstition that Smith derived his idea from other sources became even more apparent when the Apocrypha is cons consulted for evidence. Many people read the Confronted uh, during Smith's time because it was published on the some versions of the King James Bible, although the book contains a copy of number first and second. McGee had the song comment with the Book of Mormon and the gold plates. And again, Smith will turn to Freemasonry uh, to the influence of church hierarchy and procedural structure. The one similarity that exists between Mormonists and Freemasonry is the ritual of sustaining approval. Duncan's Masonic Ritual Monitor stated that Bretton, the notion is on the confirmation of the minutes of our last communication. All that are in favor of their confirmation will make it known by the usual sign of a mason. Those opposed by the same sign, which is called the usual sign of mason. When making the usual sign of a mason, a mason is raising his right arm in the form of a square and close copy of how business is sustained. In the Latter day Saints Church, meeting today, as striking as they may be, is only a small example of how Freemasonry influenced Mormonism. The most significant parallels concerning the seven priesthood office and the similarity they share with the seven degrees of masonry. 
The seventh degree of mystery are divided between two types of lodge. The master's lodge consists of three lower degrees, which is referred to enter apprentice first degree, fellow craft second degree, and master mason third degree. The chapter of royal art mason, meanwhile, consists of the four higher degrees, which are referred to as mark master fourth degree, past master fifth degree, most excellent master sixth degree, and royal arch master seventh degree. Like Freemasonry, the Mermatures was true priesthood for the lower and higher offices. Emulating the mace, Master Mason's Lodge, the Aaronic priesthood consists of three officers, deacon, teacher, and priest, and the analog to the Chatter Royal Ark Masons. The higher priesthood of Mechasitic consists of four officers during Joseph Smith's time. These officers were referred to as Elder, 70, uh, 70 Bishop, and High Counselor. The use of high priests is another parallel that exists between Mormonists and Freemasonry. High priests are responsible for overseeing all Masonic affairs according to Morgan and a royal archmason is asked, Question. Where is the high priest stationed? What are his duties? Answer. He is stationed in the Sectum Sectorium. His duty with the king and scribe to sit in the Grand Council to form plans and give direction to the workmen. Mormon high priests as high counselors and bishops similarly have in leadership position. And like Masonic high priests, who officially all the affairs of masonry, Mormon high priests after the order of the Mesitic priests who have a right to office, uh, of, officiate in their own standing under the direction of the presidency. In the ministry of spiritual things, and again, the duty of the president of the office of the high priest who is to preside over the whole church and to be like unto Moses. Masonic lodges are usually governed by three men consuls. In the lower degree, there is a master mason serving as a president while senior warden and junior warden assist him as counselor. The royal, the royal art degree is very much the same. The high priest serves as the president while the first and second counselor de denote as king and scribe, seeing in his right and left side to assist him. A royal art mason is asked during his initiation. Question. Where is the high priest stationed and what are his duties? Answer. He is stationed in the center centurion. He is studied with the king and scribe to sit in the grand council to form plans and direction to the workmen. Question. King station and duty? Answer. At the right hand of the high priest to aid him by his advice and counsel and is absent to president. Question. To scribe station and duty? Answer. At the left hand of the high priest to assist him and king in the discharge of their duties and to preside in their absence. The free man council governed most of the priesthood quorum as well. When Mormon prof property was given to the bishop for redistribution, the Lord instructed that it shall be laid before the bishop of my church and his counselors. Two of the elders of high priest such he shall appoint it or has appointed and set apart of that purpose. The presidency of the church, meanwhile, is the free man council that closely parallel to the royal art degree in which the high priest sits in council with his king and scribe. Smith wrote, of necessity, there are presidents or presiding officers of the Mesitic priesthood, their three presiding high priests, from a core of the presidency of the church. And again, the duty of the president of the office of the high priesthood is to preside over the whole church and to be like unto Moses. Joseph will utilize the legend symbols of Freemasonry. The equilateral triangle was one such symbol. This shape is a powerful image because it symbolizes the attributes of God. According to Dawkins' Masonic Rituals and Monitor, a royal art mason is asked, question, what is the equilateral or perfect triangle about which the word is formed and emblematical of? A. The three certain attributes of a deity, namely omniscient, omnipotent, and omnipresence, who has the three equal legs or angles formed by one triangle is the three attributes consisted by one God. The Aquilia Triangle is significant in its relationship to Mormonism because it equals 180 degrees, when Deacon's Quarter, which consists up to 8, 12 degrees, the Teacher's Quarter, which consists up to 24 teachers, the Priest's Quarter, which consists up to 48 priests, and the Elder's Quarter, which consists up to 96 elders, are added together the number equals 180. The most important symbolism, however, concerns John the Baptist and John the Evangelist. Biblical figures who are de designated as the patrons of masonry. According to Thomas Webb, by recurrence to the chapter upon the dedication of lodges, it will be perceived that although our ancient brethren dedicated their lodges to King Solomon, the amazing professing Christianity dedicated theirs to St. John the Baptist and St. John the Evangelist, who were the eminent patrons of masonry. 
He was also asked during the initiation ceremony for Enter Apprentice. Question, to who do Mother Maces dedicate their lodges? Answer, to St. John the Baptist and St. John the Evangelist. Question, why so? Answer, because they are the two most ancient Christian patrons of Masonry. Mormonism also assigned very important roles of John the Baptist and John the Evangelicus for the they are the patrons of Mormon priesthood. According to official accounts, it was John the Baptist who ordained Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery with the ironic priesthood. And it was the Apostle John, along with Peter and James, who bestowed upon them the higher priesthood of Messiah as part of utilizing Masonic folklore, Joseph consulted the story of the twelve Masons who were made judges over the twelve tribes of Israel. Legend reports that these Masons were given dominion of Israel as reward for the apprehending Hiram Abis assassins. According to Webb, Solomon then elected fifteen masters in whom he could be placed the highest confidence and sent in quest of the villains and gave them an escort of troops. Five days were spent in the search when terrible discovered them, a cutty stone in the quarry. They immediately seized them and bound them in chains. When they arrived in Jerusalem, they were imprisoned in the Tower of Akisir, and the next morning a punishment was inflicted on them uh, adequate to their crimes. After vengeance has been fully taken on the traitor's mansion in the forging degrees, Solomon instituted this, by a reward for the seal integrity of the Grand Masters elect of fifteen, and was by their preferment to make room for raising other worthy preference from a lower degree to that of Grand Master elected of 15. He accordingly appointed 12 out of 15. Joseph by ballot, to constitute a Grand Chapter of the Knights, and gave them command over the 12 tribes. Similar to King Solomon, Joseph Smith selected 12 high priests to serve of a governing high council of Kirtland, Ohio. Dated February 17, 1834, the revelation state this day, a general council of 24 high priests assembled at the house of Joseph Smith, June, by revelation, and proceeded to organize the high council of the Church of Christ, which was to consist of 12 high priests and one of three presidents if the case that might require. The high council was appointed by revelation for the purpose of setting important difficulty which might arise in the church. A second high council was founded high, uh, five months later in Clay County, Missouri, with David Whitmer serving as president. The governing bodies were effectively served as city councils for the state of Zion. Joseph established a third high council in 1835 to oversee the saints living outside of Kirtland and Clay County. These men had jurisdiction outside of Zion and focused most of their efforts of missionary works. And a lot of other things within the history of Mormonism, especially the church hierarchy and stuff. Accidentally, seven masons were required for an inter apprentice lodge to be opened. It was asked during the question and answer session Question, how many constitutes an enter apprentice lodge? Answer, seven. One master is sick enter apprentice. Moreover, for a master masons lodge to be opened, a petition had to be signed by at least seven masons. Explain this requirement in the Free Masons Monitor web rule, this petition being signed by at least seven regular Masons and recommended by a lodge, is delivered to the Grand Secretary who lays it before the Grand Lodge. Similar to the ironic and Messiacetic priesthood, the Dutch and High Councils and High Councillors were not fully developed until 1834, despite the fact that Smith's earlier revelation discussed such things. One of the earliest revelations to mention High Councils, High Councillors, and the second do these of high priests is the DAC section 20, which is detailed by April 1830. However, the original revelation printed as chapter 24 in the Book of Commandments denotes deacons, teachers, priests, elders, and apostles as being the only church officers. A secret ritual was introduced in 1842 that was modeled after the initiation ceremony of Free Mercy. This is called the Adomen Ceremony. Uh, that this ritual reveals to faithful Mormons the proper key words, signs, and grips that are needed to enter the celestial kingdom. Joseph Smith asserts the key of certain signs and words by which false spirits and personas may be detected from the truth, which cannot be revealed to the elders till the temple is complete. There are signs the, in the heaven, earth, and hell. Elders must know them all to be endowed with power, to finish their work and prevent imposition. The devil knows many signs, but does not know the sign of the Son of Man or Jesus. Which doesn't make sense, because in Christian theology, if 
Satan is the second most powerful being in existence. And he is, you know, if he is the second most powerful being, he's also the sm second smartest being. Even if he doesn't have omniscience, he might have nine omniscience, so he knows it. So that's stupid. But still, in harmony with Joseph's words, Freemasonry utilized secret signs and words to identify a true Mason from an imposter. According to Duncan Masonic Richard Monitor, a Mason asks, How shall I know you to be a Mason? The Mason responds by a certain sign, a token, a word, and the perfect points on my entrance. There are also Masonic reference which state that man, although to use a secret sign and password, can enter the celestial above where God and his angels reside, while being inducted into the third degree. A Mason states, if we are found worthy by his password, we shall enter into the celestial lodge above, where the supreme architect of the universe presides, where we shall all see the king in the beauty of holiness, and with him enter into an endless fraternity. Joseph drew upon the ceremony of secret society and the occult to devise the Mormon endowment and ritual first carried out in his red brick store in May 4, 1842. Similar to a man going through a Masonic initiation ceremony, an endowment participant is required to remove his clothing. After being diverse of his clothing, the endowment participant is then dressed in a white garment while going through a special washing and endowment ceremony. The ritual washing and endowment and dressing in, in Ducti in special garment re uh, resembles the ceremony which Aaron and his sons were consecrated as priests at the uh, tabernacle uh, in the book of Exodus. He was familiar with the book of Exodus. Joseph would consult secret society and initiate rites and the occult when devising the washing and atonement ceremony. Secret societies and the occult were in influenced by their founders, reading of the Bible. If the Knights of the Christian Mark is one of the secret societies that used to utilize a ritual, which the entity was dressed in a right rule, very some resembled to the Mormon endowment. Similar to the Knights of the Christian Mark, the Knight of the East and West also had an initiation ceremony, which they indicate was clothed in garment. After being dressed in white raiment, the initiate was then um, the anointed when, with perfumed oil, uh, closely resembling the Mormon endowment, the ceremony. Uh, of the ceremony. The ritual of someone being clothed in garment while being washed in a toilet is a ceremony that is also described in English translation on non canonical Jewish writing, the Testament of the Twelve Patriarchs and the Son of Jacob. The Encyclopedia Britannica described this same ceremony in 1798 as being initiated for the rite of the Eleusian Mysteries. Dr. Michael Quinn further stated that the Testament of the Twelve Patriarch, uh, Patriarchs was in print in 1827, making it very easy for Joseph for, to familiar himself with this ritual. It is clear the Latter day Saints Church in Dog Garb was clearly modeled in the magician's attire, incorporating the pentacle described in a cult literature. The LDS garment has symbol sewed in or herm into a fabric for protective purposes, as similar to the symbol which were sewed into the left and right side of the northern. The Masonic square and the compass are ham into the left and right side of the LDS upper garment. And Dolmen attire suited in ceremonial magic, Jack Joseph will borrow the garment symbols directly from Freemasonry. This symbol will serve the same function as the occult pentacles were originally cut into the fabric during the endowment ceremony and ham in later. It was as it was just mentioned, the Masonic square and a compass constitute two of these patterns. It's, n it's not coincidental that the symbol were in sight over the left and right breast, and not looking to the compass be cut into the left breast to the adornment garment. A compass was pressed against the left breast of a man becoming an enter apprentice. According to Morgan, the candidate then enters the junior deacon at the same time, pressing his naked left breast with the point on the compass and asked the candidate, Do you feel anything? Ans, I did. Junior Deacon then said, and this is the torture to your flesh, so may it ever to be your mind and conscience if you should attempt to reveal the secrecy of misery unlawfully. As similar to the square being in sight over the right breast of the LDS garment, the angle of the square was praised, pressed against the right because of the fellow graph mason, Morgan wrote, he entered the angle of the square is pressed hard against his naked right breast, which time the junior deacon said, Brother, when you entered this lodge the first time, you enter on the point of the compass pressing your naked left breast. You now enter on the angle of the square pressing your naked right breast, which is to teach you to act to the square which all mankind. 
The Adomis further connect to Freemasonry by the fact that Mormons were instructed to always wear his garment so they could stay pure in both thought and action. Similar to indoor Mormons, Freemasons were given gold rings and, and commanded to always wear them as a reminder of Masonic loyalty. Thomas Webb wrote, He then presented to him a gold ring, saying, Receive this thing and let it be remembered by you as a symbol of the alliance you have now contracted with the virtue and the virtuous. You are never, my dear brother, to be part with the wills you live. Non-Masonic secret society also required their member, their member to continue to wear an enable of some sort. Joseph utilized new name ritual because of his Masonic connection. Like in Dor Mormons, Freemasons are given new names when passing through the various degrees. During the initiation ceremony for Enter Apprentice, the most worshipful master state, I also present you with a new name. It is Caution. It teaches you, you are barely instructed in the routine, rudiments of masonry, that you should be cautious over, what all you, uh, over all your words and action, particularly when before the enemies of masonry. Testing the knowledge of the prospective mason, the most worshipper master asks, question, what are you next, uh, next presented with? A, a new name. Question, what was it? A, caution. Uh, question, what does it teach? A, it teaches me I, I was barely instructed in the rudiments of mystery that I should be conscious of all my words and actions, especially when before its enemies. The entering degrees of Mark Master Mason are presented in new name as well. This ritual is used in the context of Revelation chapter 2, verse 17. According to Morgan, the Master then produced the same keystone, concerning with so much as already been said, and said to candidate, Read we in the passage of Scripture, Revelation 2.17. To him the overcome will give to each to the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and the stone a new name is written, which no man nor is saying him that receive it. He then present the stone of the candidate, he said, I know present you with a white stone, and which is written a new name. He gave the word that formed his circle. The initials are H-T-W-S-S-T-K-S. -S Hidden tyrant, widow snow, sent to kingdom Solomon. After being anointed, cloth in a holy garment, given a new name, the Adomic participate they witness a reenactment of Genesis creation make Adam and Eve fall from paradise, the introduction of Christianity, the great apostasy, the restoration of the priesthood, etc. This is analogous to Masonic ritual, which a master mason witnessed the reenactment of Hina Abif being assassinated and then raised from the dead. I guess there's that, apparently. Also, the adorning of the garments of arrow and the green fig leaf apron is a ritual that also parallels Freemasonry. For enter apprentice were similarly dressed in a white lambskin apron and equipped with the tools of masonry, which include a karmic gavel and 24-inch gauge, which simply replaced the tool of masonry with the garment arrow and the Masonic lambskin with the green fig leaf symbolizing the Genesis story. The green fig leaf is the most prominent emblem that was borrowed from Freemasonry because it resembled the Masonic lab skin to it so closely. And an interpreter was asked during his initiation, Why did the worshipper master present you with a lab skin or white apron? If the, the lab skin has in all ages been deemed an emblem of innocence, he, therefore, who, was, who wears the lab skin as a badge of a mason, is terrified, continually reminded of that purity of life. A, re a recipe to a contact, which is also essentially necessary to our gaining a mission into Celestial Lodge above, where the Supreme Architect of the Universe resides. It is unlikely coincidence that the green fig leaf will resemble the Masonic lab skin so closely in terms of appearance and the manner in which it was worn. Even more convincing, however, is the fact that Joseph wanted to endow a proto made of lab skin if feasible. The evidence for this desire comes from 1899 Reveal Society meeting. It was recorded during the meeting. Some question now rose at the table apron, the shape and number of the leaves, and so on. As Sir Joseph Smith said that when they could be, they could have been made of lambskin with the three, nine, five, or seven leaves on them and on and on number anyway. While well, adorning the apron and rolls of the priesthood and taught the learned secret hand grace signs and coded password and penalty all before proceeding to vow and for the final segment of the ritual in the mode of Freemasonry, the grip sign and password learned so imposter can be detected and not allowed to enter the celestial kingdom. 
and like Freemasonry, the penalty or are supposed to strike the importance of not divulging any secrets. The Atomical said the four Christ, true of which are for the erotic priesthood, and the other two be associated with the higher priesthood of Mesisectic. Each group is administrated to its participants required to give the appropriate name, sign, and penalty oath. The church leader decided to remove the penalty oaths in 1990 because of the ritualistic fruit sleeping and disembowelment disturbed some members. As mentioned earlier, Freemasons also learn secret grip signs and words when inducted into various degrees. The following description is of an initiation ceremony used for enter apprentice. The text was uh, copied uh, the verbatim, so it is important to emphasize that the bracket text is not my own, but which appears in the mystery of Freemasonry. Here I quote, the following is the sign of an enter apprentice mason. It's the sign of a distress in this degree. You are not to give it unless in distress. It is given by holding your two hands, trustfully across each other, the right hand upwards, and the one each from the left. The following is to guard of the enter apprentice mason. This is given by drawing your right hand across your throat and the thumb next to your throat. Your arm is high at the elbow on a horizontal position. Brother, I now present you my right hand in token of brotherly love and esteem. With it, the grip and name of the grip of the enter apprentice mason. The right hands are joined together as in shaking hands, and each stick is found in nail into the third joint or upper end of the fourth finger. The name of the grip is Boas. Like the atonement, each Masonic degree has a penalty of these all are a pledge not to reveal the secret of Freemasonry upon the pain of death. The penalty of for enter apprentice is as follows. It will always hail for ever conceal and never reveal any part of the or parts, art or arts, point or points of the secret arts and mysteries of ancient Freemasonry, which I receive and about to receive, or may therefore by instructing in binding myself under no less penalty than to have my throat cut across my tongue, torn out by the roots, and my body buried in the rough sands of the sea and low water mark, where the tide beds and flows in the 24 hours. After learning all the sign, grips, and grip names, and penalty of the inductee take part in prior circles following the lead of the adornment of officiators. The presidents then proceed toward the veil that is separate from the celestial kingdom. Each initiate is accompanied by a ceremony work who knocks on an adjustment post three times with a mallet. At this point, a worker representing the Lord asks who it is. The workers accompany the inductee state it is Adam, even or Eve for woman who wish to con uh, converse with the Lord through the veil. At this point, the atonement participant gets all the priesthood Christ and names through holes in the veil that are cut in the shell of Masonic Square and Compass. After giving the second machine ma set the grip, the fourth grip, the work on the other side asks for his name. Having not received the name during the Genesis reenactment, the participant tells the ceremony worker that he has not learned it yet. The atonement worker then tells the inductee to embrace him in the five points of fellowship. The five points of fellowship practiced discontinued in 1990 consist of one right foot to right foot, two knee to knee, three breast to breast, four hand to back, five mouth to ear. Upon engaging in this embrace, the worker then tells the atonement participant that the name of the second must be set the grip is. After receiving and repeating the name of this grip, the workers accompany the atonement participant knocks again three times with the governor state that the inductee would like to enter the celestial kingdom. Following the script is instructed, the worker representing the Lord state that it is okay for participants to enter, at which point the inductee passed through the veil and to represent the celestial kingdom. The right in which the endowment practice passed through the veil has much in common with Freemasonry. The fine points of fellowship, which was eliminated from the ceremony in 1990, is the clearest example of how the endowment tried to duplicate Freemasonry, as the five points of bodily contact are almost identical. William Morgan gave this account for the embrace was used during the initiation ceremony for the Master Mason. He, the candidate, is raised on the call with the five points of fellowship, which are foot to foot, knee to knee, breast to breast, hand to back, and mouth to ear. This is found by putting the side of your right foot to the side of the right foot of the person to whom you are going to give the world, inside your knee to his, laying your right breast against his, your left hand to the back of each other, and your mouth to each other's right ear, in which position you are alone permitted to give the world, and whisper the word, ma, ma, mon. The procedure which endure work, knock on the post three times to notify the Lord that some want to enter 
the Celestial Kingdom, the Sarite was also borrowed from Freemasonry to the initiation ceremony for Enter Apprentice, candidate devised of all his parallel shirt accepted, and furnished with a pair of drawers, candidates conduct to the door where he is caused to give or conductor gives three distinct knocks which are answered by three form within. The conductor gives one more, which is also answered from one within. The door is then partly open, and the junior deacon generally asks who comes here, who comes there, who comes there. The conductor alias the senior deacon answer, a poor blind candidate who has long been the serious of having to receive a part of the rites and benefit the worshipper lodge. The Dominant Richard just described was the first of the two step proceed that was supposed to ensure celestial exaltation. The Atonement Ceremony was the first step in that the participant learned the proper group, signs, and password they needed to enter the Celestial Kingdom. However, to ensure the Celestial Exaltation was made sure more of us were required to go through a second ceremony known as the Second Anointing, which was in introduced in 1843. So rare was the ritual that Joseph opened it to only 18 men and their wives. The LSD temple is relation to the Freemason Lodge. A shift in ritual was initiated when construction of the Nouveau Temple com uh, commenced in 1841. The atonement, second anointment, and baptism for the temple were to be performed in one place, the temple. The temple was to become the centerpiece of the church, or the LDS worship. Drawing upon his Freemasonry background, Joseph used the Masonic Lodge as a design template for the Mormon Temple. The laying of the temple's cornerstone, which was carried out, in Cortland, 1833, Far West, 1839, and Nouveau in 1841. It's the earliest model that was borrowed from Freemasonry. Describing the Masonic ceremony which the corner store are laid for new lodges, Webb wrote, The Grand Master commands silence, and the necessary preparations are made for laying the stone. The stone is raised up by means of an engine, erected for the purpose, and the Grand Chaplain, or orator, repeats a short prayer. The Grand Treasure, then by the Grand Master's command, placed under the stone various sorts of coin and metal of the present age. Solid music is introduced, and of the stone let down into its place. The golden and silver vessel are next brought to the table, and he, the Grand Master, according to ancient ceremony, pours the corn, wine, and oil which they contain in the stone. After saying a prayer, he then strikes the stone thrice with the mallet and the public honors of masonry are given. Regarding the symbolic importance of laying the corner store, an, an, an apprentice is asked, Question, why are you conducting the northeast corner of the lodge as the youngest enter apprentice and they're caused to stand upright like a man? Your feet forming a square. So they see at the same time a solid charge over the walk and act at the upright before God and man? Answer, because the first door of a build is usually laid in the northeast corner. I was therefore placed there to receive my first instruction or to build my future Masonic and moral, uh, moral edifice. The situation of the LDS temple, so they face east and west, is practice that was also derived from Freemasonry. And the apprentice is said during his initiation, question, how should a lodge be situated? A, to east and west. Question, why so? Answer, because after Moses had safely conducted the children of Israel through the Red Sea by divine command, had he erected a temple to God and placed to its east and west, which was to commemorate the latest posteriority, the miraculous east when they wrought their mighty deliverance. This was an exact model of Solomon's temple, so at which time very well regulate and cover lodges. It's hard to be so situated. The Masonic legacy of Joseph Smith did not end at his assassination. For subsequent church leaders fully embraced Masonic symbolism when designing Salt Lake City Temple. In addition to ceremonial laying, the foundation stone and situated the temple so it will face east and west. Church architects made sure that Freemasonry's most prominent symbol was displayed on the temple exterior. Images of Clapp's hand and the OCAI are carved into the stone above the front entrance. Moreover, the beehive, another important Masonic symbol, was engraved into the handle at the entrance door. Explain the importance of the beehive and the, what it represents. Deacon states, the beehive is an emblem of industry and recommends the practice, the virtue of all created beings from the highest surfing heaven to the lowest reptile of the dust. It teaches us that we come 
into the world rational and intelligent beings. So we will ever be industrious ones, never see without content while our fellow creatures around us are in want, and when it is in our power to reveal them without inconvenience to ourselves. Not, confer and not confined to the temple, Mason is simple, but display and continue to display on various structures throughout Salt Lake Valley. The beehive, for instance, is carved into the wood pulpit for which Mormon apostles gave their general coffee speeches, indicated that the LDS Church is not quite ready to abandon its Freemasonry past. Freemasonry and other sources in the Book of Mormon Though the Bible may be heavily utilized, it is not the sole source that the Joseph Smith rely upon when writing the Book of Mormon. In addition to using Ethan Smith's book as a historical reference, Joseph would consult other authors when writing the narrative. One such author was Joseph Priest, who tried to prove that the miracles of the Bible could be scientifically explained. The most striking passage that could have been plagiarized from Priest is found in Free Nephi, with darkness covering the land, describing detail. Quoting from Adam Clark, Priest provides the following description of the darkness that beheld Egypt for three days in the book of Exodus. Darkness which may be felt a superabundance of aquarium vapor were so thick so to prevent the rays of the sun from penetrating through them and extraordinary thick mists. No artificial light could be pursued as thick clammy vapors could prevent lamps from, I, from burning. No power of fire could give them light. The darkness lasted for three days. The Book of Mormon gives very similar description of the darkness that befell America after Christ was crucified. From comparison, este, for example, there in, in Free Nephi, chapter 8, verse 20 23, there was a thick darkness about all the face of the land, and insomuch that the inhabitants could feel the vapor of darkness, and there could be no light, neither candles, neither torches, neither could there be fire candle. So there could not be any light at all. There was not any light seen, neither fire nor glimmer, neither the sun nor the moon, nor the stars for the sake so great were the midst of darkness. It came to pass it did not last for the space of three days. From the comparison of two patches, it can be deduced that Joseph was familiar with Josiah Priest's wonders of nature and public display, for all of Ella Clerk's description can be found in Free Nephi. Both narratives mention a thick darkness that could be felt. Both narratives mention extraordinary mist or vapors. Both narratives claim that sunlight could not penetrate the darkness. Both narratives state that fires and other forms of artificial light could not be procedure. In both stories, the darkness lasted for three days. While Joseph may have consulted Joseph this priest, Masonic literature proved to be much more influential. The OCNI, a prominent Masonic symbol, makes multiple appearances in the Book of Mormon. The OCNI is important because it symbolizes the ability of God to see in the hearts of men. Thomas Webb explained, although our thoughts, words, and action may be hidden from the eyes of man, yet the all-seeing eye pervades the most innermost recess of the human heart and will reward us according to our merits. Similar to Webb, Nephi using the phrase all-searching eye state, I pray to God of my salvation that he view with me with all-searching eye. Therefore, you shall know in the last day when all men shall be judged in their works. In the book of Mosia, the Alma simply preaches, yet, even at the last day, when all men shall stand to be judged of him, they shall quake and tremble, the shrinking beneath the glance of his all-searching eye. And Jacob, you see the phrase piercing eye, as so I must do according to the strict commands of God, tell you concerning your wickedness, and the presence of the, in the pure of heart, and under the glance of the piercing eye of the Almighty God, or that we show you that he can pierce you, and with one glaze in his eye can smite you to the dust. The number 24 is another Masonic symbol which appears ambiguously in the Book of Mormon. 24 is an important number because it represents the productive use of time is associated with the gauge, a tool of measurement, which is symbolically given to Mason. Masonic scholar Albert G. McKay wrote in the symbolic alphabet of Freemasonry, therefore the 24-inch gauge is a symbol of time well employed, the karmic grable, the purification of the heart. Thomas Webb states, 24-inch gauge is an instrument made use of by operator Mason and be divided into 24 equal parts. It's implemented to go the 24 hours of the day, which we are thought divided into three equal parts, whereby we find eight hours for the service of God and distress worthy brother, eight hours for usual evocation, and eight for the refreshment and sleep. There are eight passages in the Book of Mormon which utilize the number 24. The fact this number appears eight times is symbolically important 
because the Masonic God, which represents a 24-hour day, is divided into three equal parts, where we find eight hours for the service of God and the stress worthy of brother, eight hours for our usual vocation, and eight for the refreshment of sleep. The eight Book of Mormon passage read as follows. They have brought 24 plates, which are filled with the engraving, and there are of real gold. Yes, 24 of the daughters of Lamanites they carry into the wilderness. And now I will speak unto you concerning those 24 plates. Therefore, when you are about 24 years old, I will, I will doubt that ye remember the day they have observed. When they had gone through and went down, all my, all my people said it were 24 of us. Yeah, even all my people, save it, were those 24 who were with me. And I take my account for the 24 place we were found by the people who me. And when Harden had reigned gain 24 years, behold, the kingdom was taken away from him. Like 24 and all DCI, the Lihonia is a Book of Mormon image that is also rooted in Freemasonry. Nefer gives a following account of finding this device. When it comes to passages, my father rose in the morning and went forth to the tent door. To his great astonishment, he beheld upon the ground a round bowl of curious workmanship. It was in a fine brass, and when the bowl were two splinters, and the one pointed the way whither we should go into the wilderness, and we did follow the direction of the bowl, which led us in the form in the more fertile parts of the wilderness. Messiah literature, literature also mentioned press balls serving as compass-like devices. Morgan State, they also had two large globes or balls. One of the each, those globes or balls, contained on their compass service all the mass in charge of the celestial and terrestrial bodies. Their composition is molded, or cast brass, that were cast on the River Jordan, where King Solomon ordered these and all other holy vessels to be cast. They were cast hollow, were four inches, or the head breadth thick. It can be seen the glows of masonry have much in common with the Yahona. In addition to containing maps and charts of astronomical bodies, these balls are round and made of brass and small enough to be handheld. And like the Yahona, which is of curious workmanship and divine origin, the Masonic globe was supposedly cast on the River Jordan, where King Solomon ordered these and all other holy vessels to be cast. Brass in the substance from which the Leona and Glows of Masonry are both made from is symbolically important for the records, laws, and history of Freemasonry were contained in the brass balls. According to the mysteries of Freemasonry, they also had two large glows or balls, one on each. Their composition is molded or cast brass. They were archives of masonry and contained the constitution rules and records. The Book of Mormon usually like brass in the same context. It's probably how the place of brass, like the gross and masonry, contained the laws, records, and history of its forefather, Nephi State, for behold, Leba had the record of the Jews and also a genealogy of my forefathers that are engraved upon plates of brass, and I also knew that the law was engraved upon plates of brass. Joseph used Masonic symbolism was scaled to include things of very large size, for he used this symbolism to characterize the land of the Book of Mormon people. This characterization had to do with work, uh, North being associated with darkness, death, and evil. According to Albert G. McCain, the North has, with equal metaphorical propriety, been called a place of darkness, and therefore symbolic of the profane world, which has not been penetrated and illuminated by the intellectual rays of Masonic life. Hence, the, mis the masonry, the North has never been esteemed the place of darkness. William Morgan also stated no light was to be expected for the North, were therefore Masonically to turn the North a place of darkness, and explain how the South symbolized light and beauty, opposite of what the North represents. Morgan wrote, As the sun in the South, a high meridian, is the beauty and glory of the day, so stand the junior warden in the South. The Book of Mormon similarly associated the North with darkness, evil, and death, explaining how the Nephites had to gather in the land southwards because the land of northward was cursed. Nephi, the grandson of Helaman, states how laconious they caused they should gather themselves to gather in the land southwards because of the great curse which was upon the land northward. Associate north with death and carnage, if the Amaliki state in the book of Omni, and the severity of the law fell upon them, according to his judgment, which are just, and their bones lay scattered in the land northward. And in Alma chapter 22, he reads, It does the land of the north world was called desolation, and the land of the south world was called bountiful. 
and be in the wilderness which is filled with all the manner of wild animals of every kind, a part of which had come from the land northward for food. It's important to note that, North, uh, that the Norse perniciousness is also stretched in occult literature. The fact that both the occult and Freemasonry associate Norse with darkness and evil is not surprising. Some Masons were familiar with ritual magic because the occult and Freemasonry merged from the same culture. At the Owen Davies, a professor of social history and expert on magic, explained the interest in magical practice is certainly evident on the fringes of Freemasonry, but the fascination with ancient symbolism was at its heart. So in some educated quarters, Freemasonry gave a new impetus to exploration, exploit the history of magic. The example site thus far effectively demonstrates how Freemasonry influenced the Book of Mormon. However, it's Joseph's use of Masonic terms to describe secret societies in the candy and the robes that stands out as the Book of Mormon's most prominent Freemasonry trait. The most descriptive detail was derived from Masonic monitors and anti-Masonic literature. Um, Anti-Masonic references are also part of it that Joseph even tried to capitalize them by their submitting in the Book of Mormon to throw weed of the anti-Masonic inquiry for publication. Masonic terminology is most pronounced in the book of Helaman. It states in regard to get the end of robes, in, and I quote, and it came to pass that they have their signs, yea, their secret signs and their secret words, and this they might be distinct, a brother who had entered into the covenant, that whatsoever wickedness his brother should do, he should not be in, injured by his brother, nor by those who did belong to his hand, had taken this covenant. Parallel in Helema, Chapter 6, verse 22, Duncan's Masonic ritual and monitor state that Mason must give certain signs, token, and word to distinguish himself as being worthy brother of the Lodge. According to this part, the Mason it says, How shall I know you to be a Mason? The Mason responds by certain signs and token of word in the perfect points of my entrance. Similar to Duncan's Masonic ritual and monitor, Morgan's illustration of Masonry asserts that the sign to guards great words, passwords, and their several names comprise pretty much all the secrets of masonry. Helema chapter 6 verse 22 mentioned gatiator robbers as being swore to protect each other even if a crime be committed. The passage read, whatsoever wicked that his brother should do, he should not be injured by his brother, nor by those who did belong to his hand, who had taken this confidence. This passage's Masonic content is obvious because anti-Masonic sources make the same play about Freemasons. William Morgan, putting words into the mouth of the Royal Arch Mason, wrote, I will aid and assist the companion Royal Arch Mason when engaged in, my, in any difficulty, wherever he may be right or wrong. Furthermore, do I promise and swear that the companion Royal Arch Mason's secret shall remain as secure and inviolable in my breast as his sword, murder and treason not accepted. Many other written sources accuse Masons of protecting each other from law enforcement. The Palmyria Freeman state in March 18, 1828 article, the obligation of one of the degrees of Freemasonry to protect a brother right or wrong and to preserve his secret inviolate even in case of murder and treason is a tendency to honor the arm of justice and to afford protection to the vicious and profligate from the punishment due to their crimes. Expressing the same concern about Mason's criminal immunity, anti-Masonic writer John G. Stern wrote, "A royal art Mason see at once, and if he is commits crime, there is but little prospect for being detected, even should he be his brethren, who perhaps are the minister of justice, or suddenly, you know, bound, not only to consider his crime, but to assist him so far as to put him beyond the reach of punishment, to extricate him from his difficulty where he is right or wrong. Helema chapter 6 verse 22 is of course not the only passage in the Book of Mormon that condemns secret societies. Describing the Jeredites involvement in secret combination, the Book of Alma states, And thus the judgment of God did come upon these workers of darkness, a secret combination. Explaining how the Canadian robes are disrupted to peace, the Book of Helema states there, there was a continual peace established in the land, all saving were the secret combination. We came the air, the rubber has established in the more settled parts of the land. Make a connection between secret combination, secret oaths, and the words of wickedness. M Mormon wrote that the wicked part of the people began again to build up the secret and oaths in combination of gaviating. Describing the power and influence of secret society during the times of Jeredites, Moroni, Porpets, 
for so great had been spreading of this wicked secret society. They had corrupted the hearts of all the people. Therefore, Jerry was murdered upon his throne, and a kiss regarding in his head in his stead. And explaining how se secret combination can lead to overthrow severe uh, sovereign nations, Morori exhort, in whatsoever nation show upon such secret combination to get power and gain until they shall spread over the nation, behold, they shall be destroyed. Parallel the Book of Mormon passage, just cite antique Masonic literature, uh, express the same sentiment. Commenting on the disappearance of William Morgan, the Parliament of Freeman State in 1828, almost two years ago, a free citizen was taken violently from a protection of the law, carried 150 miles, and therefore deliberately murdered. This was done by a secret society to vindicate its secret laws. Kodemi V. Beta Kappa, an author of the Rochester anti Masonic Inquiry World in 1829, I am decidedly opposed to all combination and secret association whatsoever. The natural tendency of all secret society is evil, and I grieve and surprise that the seeds of secret combination should be sown in his seminary of education. Explaining how a secret combination associated with Freemasonry can undermine personal liberty, the anti Masonic Review and Magazine state in 1828, where is a prophet of our laws. If a secret combination of man may strength grease and defy them at will, where is the privilege of an American if we are liable to be seized, dragged before a secret tribunal and condemned without form of civil law and execute without religious right or human mercy? Freemasonry has done it, and warning his reader of the danger posed to the United States by secret society and secret combination, John T. Stearns wrote, Secret societies is dangerous to any government. In one day, they might strike a death blow to liberties of our happy land and crown one of the grand kings, monarchs of America. If secret society of America becomes so corrupt as to enter the extensive combination to destroy the property of their fellow citizens, to drag them into their homes, to rob them of their liberties, even to murder them in cold blood, and this combination embrace some of those who are sworn conservators of the public space, then what may have not expect? Joseph will also consult Freemasonry and will describe the gladiator robes appearance. Nephi, the son of Helama, stated that the gladiator robes did come out to battle and they will write about after the battle of robbers and they will have a lambskin about their lions and they will die in blood and their heads were shorn. This passion Masonic contest is tied to the fact that a mason was adorned with a lambskin apron with becoming an Easter apprentice. Morgan wrote the master returned to his seat and gets a lambskin or white apron, presented it to the candidate observed, Brother, I now present you with a lapskin or white apron. It is the badge of a mason. Describe the same ritual, Lucas Masonic ritual and monitor Reese, Brother, I now present you with a lapskin or white apron, which is the emblem of innocence in the patches of a mason. The Book of Mormon condemns secret societies and their use of secret science and word, yet Smith will incorporate this same practice into the adornment where it was introduced in 1848. As it will be explained later, in the Mormon are similarly required to their secret sign, grace, and password. Even the gladiator's robes, lapskin, which was derived from the Masonic lapskin apron, which incorporated into their ceremony. The lapskin was simply replaced with a green fig, leaf symbolized the Genesis creation story. Not limited to dress, terms, and symbols, Joseph will take 19th century Masonic phrases and place them in the lips of the Book of Mormon characters. This type of plagiarism is from a true nephew in chapter 1, verse 14, when Lefty realizes his life is about to end, exhort, awake and arise from the dust and heart and hear the words of the trembling parent, whose lips, limbs yet must soon lay down in the cold and silent grave, but was no troubler can return. This is the 1830 edition, page 61. Proof of plagiarism comes from the fact that these words appear within Shakespeare's Hamlet. Shakespeare wrote, but that he had dread of something after death, the undiscovered country, from whose bound no traveler returns. It's unlikely that Smith defied the phrase, once no traveler can return by reading Shakespeare. It's more likely they brought the praise for 19th century sources, which were, which are Masonic, retelling the funeral eulogy of the deceased Mason. Thomas Rep wrote that when the awful moment arrives, by soon or late may be enabled to persecute a journey to that far distant country, has no traveler return. Detailing the words used in the initiation ceremony for the fellow craft mason, Dawkins Masonic Ritual and uh, Monitor states, We are traveling upon the level of time to that undiscovered country for those borrowed no trouble returns. 
Explain the same ritual, Morgan's mysteries of Freemasonry reads, who are travelers of the level of time to the undiscovered country, the dog born into travelers has returned. Not Masonic, but using the phrase in the context of someone facing death, Josiah Priest wrote, A direct procession to leave me as my time has shown, as some preparation to make before I went to death bound from whence no trouble returns. Three of the four sources just cite are Masonic indicate that Joseph was attracted to the phrase because of his free masonry connections. Thomas Webb, when says no trouble returns, closely parallel to Leahy's exhortation and is even used in the cause of someone facing death. However, Josiah Priest also used the words once no trouble returns in the situation of someone facing death. As stated earlier, Joseph probably consulted Priest, uh, Priest's book when described to the darkness in Free Nephi and the importance of the law in True Nephi. It's possible that Smith was drawing upon both Josiah's brief and Masonic literature when utilizing Shakespeare's words. Faith, Hope, and Charity is another book, uh, book of Mormon phrase which was probably derived from Freemasonry. Taken from 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 13, this phrase is found multiple times in most Masonic sources. The Anti-Masonic Review of Magazine states the text of the Masons' Discord is 1 Corinthians 13, 13. Now, I bind faith, hope, and charity, these free, but the grace of these is charity. Thomas Reb wrote the three principal rounds of which the dominated faith, hope, and charity, in which are Autonomous us to have faith in God, hope in immortality, and charity to all mankind. Dokus Masonic Richard and Monitor similarly reads, May we daily increase in faith, hope, and charity, but more especially in that charity which is the bound of peace and perfection of every virtue. Of all the authors cited in this in that book, William Morgan invoked the phrase most frequently, a funny uh, quote taken from the mystery of Freemasonry. We may daily increase in faith, hope, and charity. Question. How do you hope to arrive there? Answer by assistance of Jacob's ladder. J question: How many principal rounds has it got? Answer: Three. Question: What are their names? Question: Answer: Faith, hope, charity. Worshipper, if we uh, worship for while we are peacefully at work on the second degree of mystery under the influence of faith, hope, and charity. Afford a present you with three precious jewels. Their name is faith, hope, and charity. As Masonic inspired text, the Book of Mormon also invoked the word faith, hope, and charity for their manifest on at least five separate occasions. As see that you have faith, hope, and charity, then you will always around abound in good works. Before I will show you in the Gentile the weakness, I will show unto them faith, hope, and charity, bring unto me the fountain of all righteousness. And now I, Moroni, write a few of the words of my father Mormon, who he spark concerning faith, hope, and charity. Behold, I say unto you, that he that supposed that little children need a baptism is the goal of bitterness and is the bound of iniquity, for they have neither their faith, hope, and char nor charity. Wherefore there must be faith, and there must be faith, there must be also be hope, and there must be hope, there also must be charity. These phrases appear four times in the Doctrines and Covenants, a parallel exemplary how Joseph utilized the same source and literary style when writing his revelation. A faith, hope, and charity of love with the eyes single to the glory of God. Clarify him for the word. Be patient, be sober, be temperate, be patient, have patience, faith, hope, and charity. And no can assist this work except shall be humble, for of love, have faith, hope, and charity. And if you have not had faith, hope, and charity, you can do nothing. Freemasonry is a pervasive all throughout Mormon scripture and constitutes its most dominant non biblical source. Such as a fact is not surprising, considering that Freemasonry contributes so much to Mormon doctrine, especially Mormon priesthood and endowment ceremony. But before examining these and other doctrines, the Book of Mormon is authors still need to give it further attention. And like I said, I already mentioned this earlier, and basically, Mormonism, or the Church of Jesus Christ, let to say, has founded Freemasonry, but mixed with primitive Christianity, it, uh, Methodism, folk magic, and the occultism, and put the, all these things together, you have the Mormon faith.